I'm Gil Ramnan, uh, father of Eves and Tami, founder, co-founder, and chairman of The Familists at familism.org. I'd like to try and make some sense of what we've already heard today and what it is that we're seeing here. So let's start with a quote from John Stuart Mill's The Subjection of Women, which I think is very uh, relevant to this conference. In every respect, writes Mill, in every respect, the burden is hard on those who attack an almost universal opinion. They must be very fortunate, as well as unusually capable, if they obtain a hearing at all. Now, I should say that I stole that quote from the opening pages of a new book called The Privileged Sex by Professor Martin Van Preffel, uh, which is coming out soon on Amazon and which I highly recommend. And it applies to Martin himself, who is a pioneer of historical criticism of genderist claims, and he's sitting right over there. It applies to Professor Murray Strauss, our guest of honor and keynote speaker here, and it applies to Professor Sarah Ben David. Professor Ben David has been absolutely fearless in this uh, fight, and it is a fight, and it's for this reason that we at the Families intend to nominate her for the next uh, Israel Prize for Criminology. The The quote also applies to uh, Mark Langfan of New York, a true patriot whose generosity has helped to make this important conference a reality. Now, as I said, we call ourselves familists. We believe in familism. So what is familism? Familism is the approach that views men's rights and obligations, women's rights and obligations, and children's rights and obligations within the framework of family and views the family itself as a valuable unit that needs to be maintained. The opposite approach is the genderist approach. The genderist approach is an approach that involves identifying with one gender and then organizing as a gender and proceeding to fight the other gender for power. This is an approach that is reminiscent of class warfare and I want to quote Professor Ruth Wise of Harvard who summed things up when she said about this movement. Quote, by defining relations between men and women in terms of power and competition, instead of reciprocity and cooperation, the movement tore apart the most basic and fragile contract in human society, the unit from which all other social institutions draw their strength. So you see, what we're talking about here is a very serious matter that goes beyond the scope of academic research. Now, Professor Strauss, you've shown us two presentations in one. The first is an academic presentation about intimate partner violence. The second, I perceive as a cry for help. It's a cry for intervention. In the second part of your presentation before us, and in other presentations in the same vein that you've made over the years, you've essentially told us the following. A certain force is preventing me and my colleagues from doing our jobs. We've reached certain findings. We wish to publish these findings. But a force stronger than ourselves, which we do not have the tools to deal with, is systematically hindering our ability to carry out our research on the topics we choose to study in accordance with our academic and scientific standards. The same force has been misrepresenting our findings through malevolent deeds, like publishing only one column of data out of two columns in a way that changes the entire nature of the findings. So obviously you never said all this in quite this way, but this is how I understand the message that you're delivering between the lines. And as you said, this has been going on since 1977 at least. So that's 35 years. And, and there's no real change, 36 years. You are the whistleblower, and you've provided us with a smoking gun. And the obvious question is, who's holding that gun? Who's behind this? Well, Professor Wise identified the culprit in political terms. And Dr. Don Dutton of the University of British Columbia referred to the same political stream in the conference titled From Ideology to Inclusion that you were a part of, Professor Strauss, which took place in Sacramento in 2008. Aaron Pitsy, the indomitable founder of the first shelters for victims of domestic violence in Britain, who was the guest of honor at that conference, has pointed very clearly to the same political movement. And she's done so over and over again. 
and, and she wasn't inside it. She was there when it happened. So the politics are there, any way you look at it, Professor Stress. Professor Ben David, Dr. Levy, Dr. Aviad, Dr. Boninoff. And there's a saying, it takes a nail to drive out a nail. And that's why I think it's legitimate and even required of you, morally and professionally, to work with whoever can deliver the goods and free you from this yoke of violent oppression. Otherwise, this entire field of research is debased, and your life's work has been wrenched away from you and used as a tool of oppression. Now, I say oppression because there are people in this hall whose children have been deprived of the right to be raised by a loving father through the influence of manufactured statistics that have your name stamped on them, Professor Strauss. Besides the fact that these children miss their fathers terribly, they're at far greater risk of all kinds of social deviance as a result of being separated from their fathers. From dropping out of school through unwanted teenage pregnancy, alcohol, drug abuse, criminal activity, all the way down to falling victim to abuse of various types and serving time in jail. Children who grow up without two involved parents in their lives are at far greater risk. And this is not a manufactured or inflated statistic. It is not a cherry-picked statistic. Now, I want to talk about Israel for a while and then make the connection to the rest of the world. In 1998, an interministerial committee on domestic violence was convened in order to coordinate the way government branches deal with complaints about domestic violence. The committee was headed by then head of the National Insurance Institute, which is Israel's Welfare Institute, Dr. Igor Ben Shalom. Providing academic for the, uh, background for the committee was Dr. Orly Ines Kenny, who received her doctorate in social work from Haifa University. <clears throat> in the introduction to the committee's report, your name appears, Professor Strauss. Next to it is the claim that 27.8% of American women were hit at least once in their lifetimes by their husbands. This supposedly comes from research you published in 1986. Based upon this supposed finding by you, the person who wrote the introduction to the committee's report supposedly did some extrapolating and found that there are between 150,000 and 200,000 battered women in Israel. I assume that this person was Dr. Ines Kenny because the same paragraph appears verbatim in a document signed by her which gives instructions regarding the proper way of treating violent men dated 2002. This magic number of 200,000 battered women has been circulating in Israel since at least the 1990s. It started out as 100,000, then climbed to 150,000, and quickly reached 200,000. This number appears in dozens, if not hundreds, of explanatory notes to pieces of legislation. And it comes up regularly in speeches, lectures, articles, media programs, etc. on the subject. This happens especially on March 8th, which is International Women's Day, an old uh, Soviet holiday that has recently received new life in Israel and is marked by the Knesset, and on November 25th, which was declared as the day of the struggle for elimination of violence against women by the United Nations in 1999. The number is a factoid. It has no base in research other than that extrapolation from a finding by you, which, based on what you have just told us, is actually part of a pattern of deliberate misrepresentation of findings that were made by you and other researchers. The misrepresentation is not just reflected in the number of battered women, but in the basic picture of domestic violence as being one and the same as wife -bed. I should say that these scare numbers, these scare numbers, are not the only means of propaganda being used against men here. To reach maximum efficacy, the scare numbers are combined with a press that has been trained to magnify cases of spousal murder by men in a way that creates hysteria. Cases of spousal murder are front page news here, and they're often the top headline, topping even the Iranian nuclear danger. Now, once men as a group have been stigmatized as violent, they, or should I say we, have been marked as somehow less than human, less human than the rest of us. 
or should I say, the rest of you. They've been marked out by the gender warfare mechanism as enemies of the state in much the same way that the bourgeois were marked out as enemies by the class warfare mechanism. And once you're less human, <clears throat> it's okay to push you out of your home without any proof of wrongdoing. It is okay to push you out of your children's lives forever. It is okay to arrest you and put you in a prison cell with murderers and rapists. It is okay <clears throat> to turn you into a, a person with a criminal record. It is okay to make you a child support slave, regardless of your earning power. Here in Israel, it is not uncommon for the court to garnish a man's disability stipend for the benefit of child support, even if that is his sole livelihood. Judges occasionally tell men to go sleep on a park bench after garnishing their entire salary. Now, as we've seen, if you push a child's daddy or mommy out of his or her life, and in this case we're talking mostly about daddies, that child is at far greater risk, period. Over the years, millions of children are affected by the fact that your name, Professor Strauss, along with others, has been hijacked to serve as a stamp of authority for false statistics. And when I say millions, I'm still talking about Israel alone. The good news about how bad things have gotten is that there's finally a wide-scale awakening now after decades in which this problem was allowed to fester and simply viewed as an unchangeable evil. There's a new term out there which is gaining currency, MRA, or Men's Rights Activist. Dr. Warren Farrell and his excellent books exposing the inaccuracies promoted by the generous propaganda machine have had a gradual galvanizing effect. Professor Janice Fumengo of the University of Ottawa has been saying in a powerful way recently that the gender science departments are not really about science, but are rather the academic arm of a special interest lobby group, as she puts it. They are not about scholarly research, but about indoctrination, she says, and there's no place for that. <clears throat> now, what I want to uh, suggest here is that there is a need for a pro-family movement but I disagree with Professor Fumengo about closing down the gender studies departments as she seems to want to do. They're known as gender sciences here. But rather, I think the idea should be to widen and change them into departments that study family science or even family and gender science. Family science would study most of the subjects that gender science deals with. But unlike gender science, it would be scientific. As regards violence, it would not take research results that have two columns of data and delete the second one. It would leave in that second column and it would deal with reality. And it would not just deal with intimate partner violence, it would also deal with violence towards children. This conference that we're in is possibly the most liberated international university conference on the subject of family conflict in the history of the world. And yet we do not have a speaker on violence against children. This is not because of any bias by us on the steering committee. Rather, it reflects the current state of research which is preoccupied with pitting women against men. It is a very sad state of affairs and it needs to change. As you may know, most of the violence against children is perpetrated by women, making this a useless subject for gender propaganda. Useless for gender studies, but very central in the as yet unborn field of family science. As regards earnings, family science would not just fill the air with statistics that show that women earn less than men on average. It would also ask what drives men to earn more. It would ask men about their sense of responsibility as breadwinners. It would map out how much of the average father's earnings go to buying his own stuff how much goes to buying his wife's stuff, and his children's stuff, and the entire family's stuff. And it would ask the same question about women's earnings. It would find out... It would find out scientifically if maternal instinct actually exists. It would find out if chivalrous instinct actually exists. Do men have a protective instinct? Why was it, as Professor Fiumengo has pointed out, that 75% of the women aboard the Titanic survived, but only 18% of the men survived. So that is why I think 
we need to start thinking more and more of a world family movement based upon family science. The flag of family is a flag of leadership. Imagine the Titanic as it sank into the frozen ocean seas with most of the women and children safe in the lifeboats. And perhaps you will see the very same flag flying from its mast. I believe that good men will rally to this flag, and a place populated by good men is also a good, safe place for women and children to be.